everyone for joining us for this webinar on cable diagnostics, soldering skills, and troubleshooting by Fedge Sylvanas. My name is Mallory Misnarsik, and I'm the project manager here at Harman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter, and he'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded, and a link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we encourage you to look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Fedge, the presenter for today's webinar. Currently the Chief Repair and Fabrication Technician at Rat Sound, Fetch has over 40 years of experience as a front of house and monitoring engineer, a tour and production manager, technician and electrician for artists including Akon, Aretha Franklin, Patti LaBelle, Toto, Primus, Fishbone, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I'll pass it over to you, Fetch. Why, thank you, Mallory. Hello, everybody. My name is Fetch. And before we get started, I have a little greeting from my good friend, Dave Ratt. I'm Dave Ratt, and my friend Fed, for many, many years, is doing some cable training. He's been our tech here for quite a while at Rat Sound, and uh, you ought to check out what he's doing. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fedge. The uh, legal name is Jeff, but uh, Fedge uh, became a nickname of mine many years ago, and it stuck. Um, many of you will be adorned with your own nickname uh, if you haven't been already. And um, it comes in real handy in our end of uh, the business with uh, being recognized in an instant. So just get used to it. My name is Fedge. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about, um, uh, well, first, let's get this out of the way. Um, I wanted to uh, thank JBL Professional and Harman for putting all of this together. Um, it's an honor to uh, reach out to all of you and um, get some training going on with everything else that's going on in the world these days. Um, I also want to thank uh, Smoke and Mirrors for allowing us the studio and all of the equipment to put this um, webinar together. Um, and I also wanted to thank all of you and the audience for tuning in. Um, so um, as I said, my name is Fedge. Um, I've had over 40 years of uh, experience in the business. Um, I started young. Uh, I was doing my first plays in live theater um, at the ripe old age of nine years old. Um, I instantly uh, uh, gravitated towards backstage and um, all of the intricacies of putting a show together. Um, spent a short amount of my life pursuing a performance career, but realized I'd get a lot more work working backstage than I would on stage. So I stuck with that. Um, I transitioned to music, um, live music, and most of my experience, um, uh, most of my experience has been with the live stage. Um, I've touched uh, a, a certain amount of time in the studio, and in television production and in film production, but I always love the live stage. There's nothing quite as wonderful to me as that. Uh, my positions have included everything from being a driver to uh, running front of house, monitors, uh, systems tech, um, uh, the fix-it guy on hand at all times. Uh, I've done guitar tech, bass tech, drum tech, keyboard tech, all of those wonderful things on stage. Uh, but my main love has always been sound and audio. Um, uh, I've toured around the world, uh, been around the world probably at least 20 times, probably more. Um, 
whenever I was off of the road, I always went back to the clubs, the nightclubs, just to pay the rent. Um, but it always kept me in the mix, so to speak. Kept me busy until I was ready to tour again. Uh, now I find myself at the shop because it's stable. Um, I don't have to put myself through the rigors of crushing volumes every day as I used to love as a kid. But now that I'm 60 years old, it uh, puts a weight on my uh, livelihood. Uh, I'm now with uh, Rat Sound. Um, Rat Sound handles, uh, amongst others, the Coachella Fest. Uh, we do all of the sound for that. Um, every single stage, every single PA, every single monitor rig, everything. Um, but that's only one of the major festivals that we do. We also take care of a lot of bands, um, Red Hot Chili Peppers being one, uh, Pearl Jam being another. So we're a very lucrative when it's working, and right now everybody's in a bind with what's going on in the world. So we decided it was worthwhile to have me reach out and uh, join in on some of these training sessions. Um, the reason I decided to do it is uh, when we were talking about the different aspects of training that was available to all of you out there, um, I realized most of you now uh, are dealing with digital. Um, everything in the world right now is digital audio. Uh, when I grew up, I grew up in nothing but analog. Uh, digital was a pipe dream. Um, and digital allows you much more versatility in everything you can do, uh, everything you can manipulate, um, all of the nuances that make audio a fully enriching experience for everybody. So digital is a wonderful thing. However, the only way that you can get that signal from a microphone to all of those digital devices that you've got is a mic cable. So I wanted to center the, uh, the key point of this experience for today on mic cables. Now we only have an hour, um, so perhaps in the future we can get on to uh, digital cables, we can get onto speaker cables, we can get onto any multitude of the other cables that there are that you need to know to provide every aspect of audio. Uh, I'm going to keep everything to the um, uh, perspective of a live stage. Um, I'll touch a little bit on studio, but most of what I'm going to explain to you will be what you need to know to put on a live performance. So let's get started. The first thing you need to think about is the amount of tools you are going to need um, to be able to not only uh, fix anything that goes wrong, but also to um, diagnose anything that might be trouble. Um, and with all of the uh, uh, devices that are available out there, there's a wide variety of tools, but I'm going to limit it in this explanation to just what you're going to need to work with mic cables. Um, you'll need, um, well, let's start at the top of the list. Everything requires paperwork, and I've got everything written on paperwork, so I wouldn't forget. Uh, first on the list is a meter, uh, a multimeter. Um, it's a standard issue thing. You can find it at almost every electronic store. The basic components of it go from uh, voltage testing to resistance to um, continuity. And continuity is the main thing you're going to need out of that meter. So if it does anything else, that's great. But the main thing is you want something that can show you continuity, a continuous signal from one end of a line to the other. The next thing you need is a cable tester. Now there's a wide variety available on the market. Um, uh, at the shop we use the, um, the Whirlwind um, 
variety as our main uh, tester. The um, uh, This one in particular has the availability to check XLR cables as well as speaker cables, two different varieties. Um, they're a wonderful tool to have and they're a great thing to have at your shop, but the only trouble with them is you need both ends of the cable at the box. Uh, as long as you're working in a shop environment or uh, in a isolated location where you can get to both ends of a cable, these are wonderful. However, when you're working on a live stage, a lot of times you will find that the cable you're trying to look at, trying to diagnose, will be already laid across the stage. And that's where this wonderful little tool comes in. And uh, let's go to uh, that tight little shot. This is called a sniffer sender. It's made by Sound Tools. Um, and if you'll notice, it has XLR ends, a male and a female. And on the other ends, it has an on-off switch and three little LEDs. Now, when I plug it in and turn it on, you can see that all three LEDs are green. That means you've got a good cable. If it shows any other configuration of colors, uh, whether it's blank or red or uh, missing, you can take a look at the chart that comes along with each tool and see what the trouble is. The advantage of this is I can take, um, we can go back to the full shot, there you go. Um, I can take this and put it on each end of the cable as it is run on stage. Or I can take one end of this all the way out to the front of house console and bring the other end up on stage to find out what the trouble is, if there is any trouble with any of the cables. And if you go back to the tight shot, if you look on this, it's only showing one green LED, so I've got a problem with this cable. And by looking on the chart, I can figure out exactly what it is. But I don't have to have both ends of the cable right here in front of me. So it's a marvelous little tool. If you can get a hold of one, they're available at samtools.com. And I'll be using this for most of the work we're doing today. Um, uh, next in line for tools is uh, you want some good strippers. Uh, basically, this peels the jacket away from the conductors inside of the cable. Um, I've got a, I've got two varieties. Um, one goes up to a rather large scale, um, uh, not quite as big as the cables themselves, but it gets me up to uh, number 10 gauge wire if I need to strip that. Okay. Um, uh, and that goes all the way down to 20 gauge wire. Um, however, a lot of my cables have smaller than 20 gauge wire in them. So I've got another stripper that goes to smaller gauges of wire. Uh, mm. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so this one does minute uh, scale of gauges of wire uh, as well as uh, up to 20 gauge. But for some of my cables, I'm going to need to use that uh, to get down to the finer gauges of wire. Um, you'll need uh, some needle nose. Uh, I have two different pair. Um, uh, one for close work and one for really tiny, fine stuff that I always keep with me. Uh, a pair of clippers or cutters. Uh, a good old, um, uh, good old pair of pliers, um, slip joint pliers as we call them, so they can get to a larger aperture or a smaller complete clamp. Um, a solder sucker. This is a wonderful device that if you ever make a mistake with your solder or you are trying to 
uh, get rid of the solder that might be in the way. Um, this little guy, once you've heated up a solder joint, you put that little nib right on where you've got the solder, push the little plunger, and it sucks everything out of the way. Um, this particular one is a solder pult uh, made by Edson, and it's a wonderful company, and they also make my soldering iron. Um, a knife is very important. Um, now, I have a multi-tool that I use for um, uh, any variety of things. It's, it has a plier, it has screwdriver bits, it has a wonderful variety of things, but it also has, more importantly, two knife blades. One is serrated, one is uh, just a straight blade. Um, knife is very important, um, and you will use it a lot more than you ever thought you would just being on a live stage. Uh, and last, of course, a soldering iron. Now, mine, um, I have invested the uh, extra money <laughs> to have a variable uh, heat gauge. So I have uh, a temperature gauge that can go down to, let's see, as down as 400 degrees and as high as 800 degrees. Um, the reason I have that is I do a lot more work than just cables. Uh, I'll do a lot of intricate work on uh, printed circuit boards and amplifiers and um, any variety of electronics that I'll need to repair. And uh, depending on the melting point of the solder I'm using, um, uh, I don't want to damage any of the equipment, so I can t variably turn this uh, temperature down on the soldering iron so that I won't damage any of the particular um, electronics that I'm working on. But since we're working with cable, I'm leaving it wide open, right up to 800 degrees. I want to get a nice hot solder joint, and I want to get it done quickly. But being that it's... Um, 800 degrees, must be careful with it. Um, I need to be very wary of where this is going to be placed and for how long so that I don't do any damage to any cable or myself. And of course, with the soldering iron comes solder. Um, you need to be, uh, oh, before I leave that, um, uh, there are standard varieties of uh, just plug in and go soldering irons that um, you should be aware of. You want to get at least a 30 watt uh, soldering iron, uh, 40 watt if you can get it. Um, uh, 40 watt won't quite go up to the temperatures that this will, but it'll certainly get to temperatures that would uh, allow you to work on some heavier cable. Um, 30 watt is fine for what we're doing with uh, microphone cable. Um, on to solder. Um, there are two varieties of, um, uh, well, actually three varieties of solder. Um, um, what I'm working with and what I will be working with throughout this um, uh, webinar is uh, lead-based solder. Um, there is lead-free solder, and it is... Um, recommended these days that you use lead-free solder. The trouble is that to use it, you need to have absolutely brand new equipment to start and then never use anything other than lead-free solder. Um, since I've been using my rig, um, I use um, leaded solder, um, which is dangerous to breathe in the fumes. So you must make sure you're in a well-ventilated area. Um, for my work right now, I've always got a fan uh, blowing across any place that I need to work um, on any of the solder. Um, it is advisable um, for health reasons that you get used to working with lead-free solder. Uh, but as long as you're following safety precautions, um, I find that uh, leaded solder is easier to work with. Uh, it melts quicker. Um, 
and it creates a tighter bond um, with less heat. Um, so what we're working with is leaded solder. There are a variety of um, uh, components that make up the solder. There are different contents, and you can look up at the store or the manufacturer what you want um, as far as those contents. Um, I believe mine is, and it's always written on the side of the spool, um, what the content of the solder is. Um, they'll give you a content of how much lead, uh, how much tin, and um, I'm trying to look. Mine is 3.3% lead and 44% tin. Um, there are different gauges as far as width of solder. Um, uh, I like the, for uh, working with my cables, I like the uh, heavier gauge. I believe it's 60 millimeter or 16 millimeter. I can't remember. Yeah, at any rate. Uh, oh, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 millimeter. There's also a very fine, thin solder that you can get. Um, and that's very good for doing uh, light gauge wire. Um, if you're, if this is your only choice, it can certainly do my cables. It just takes a lot longer piece of solder as you're making the connection. Um, there are also two different, well, there are three different types of um, uh, let me rephrase that. <laughs> there are two different types of cord solder. They have uh, either a rosin or acid in the core right down the middle of the solder, um, and that is to take the place of the old-fashioned original solder that is um, that has no core at all and you um, require flux. Flux is either acid or rosin core, um, or, or I'm sorry, acid or rosin base. And all, uh, all flux will do is clean off all of the metal, um, uh, either on the conductor end, on the wire, um, or the terminal end, your connector, um, so that you can get a nice, clean, solid solder connection. Uh, the advantage of using the cord solder is you don't need the separate flux. It's already got it inside of the solder. Um, now, a lot of you have probably um, already learned a lot of this. Um, so, uh, sorry for the review, but it's very important for those that are just learning uh, to know this. Uh, along with all of those wonderful things, um, you'll need a way to clean your soldering iron. Um, it's two different types. There's a sponge that you just get damp with some water and that'll wipe off the excess dirt and gunk and debris that collects on the soldering tip. Or the one I like, which is brass wool. And you just basically can jab the end of the uh, soldering iron in there and it'll remove all of the debris. Um, it's up to you, whichever you like, you know, but you need it to clean off all of the dirt when you're ready to make your solder connection. Um, uh, lastly, as far as tools, what you will need when working with mic cables is a set of jeweler's screwdrivers, if you want to get in a tight shot for that. Um, uh, basically, it's small gauge screwdrivers, Phillips and Flathead. And the reason you need those is because um, you are still going to run into the original um, uh, old-fashioned style connectors somewhere along the way. Um, the newer connectors, um, the most popular is Neutrik, um, and that comes, it, it needs no screws at all. Um, everything is, uh, every part on the connector is, um, uh, attachable or detachable by hand, um, and no screws required. Uh, but when it was originally designed, and 
this would be a good time to go into it. Um, there's a little history of the XLR cable. Um, and I have an example of one of the originals. Go to that little tight shot there. This is the original XLR cable. It was made by a company called Canon. And when I was a kid growing up, um, they used to refer to the mic cables as Canon connectors. Um, uh, XLR became the common expression. Um, Canon, when making, um, when making the connector, uh, the original microphones that they were using were um, uh, as much as 600 volts running through the line. Um, and they had a rather beefy connector, um, uh, more than a couple of inches in diameter and in some cases. But they wanted to make something that was more compact and more easily um, uh, removable and repairable. Um, they came up with the X connector. And that was the three pins that you'll see on an XLR. Uh, but it didn't have a latch. So the X connector with a latch became the XL connector. And then they decided to rubberize the insulation around the pins, and that became the R in XLR. However, um, everybody still calls the connector an XLR, even though now we're plastic parts and uh, we don't have any of the original uh, screws and stuff that hold down the clamps and all of that. But everybody calls the connector an XLR connector. Um, to give you an example of why, there's this wonderful thing. Everybody knows this as a crescent wrench. Well, the actual name for it when it was originally built was an adjustable spanner. But nobody calls it an adjustable spanner. It was originally made by the Crescent Tool Company. So everybody got used to calling it a crescent wrench. And no matter who makes it now, and there's a multitude of manufacturers, everybody refers to it as a crescent wrench. Same thing goes for the XLR. Even though you're not uh, buying a connector made by the Canon company any longer, it's still called an XLR, just the same way that they call uh, the crescent wrench a crescent wrench. Um, in uh, in the need for those uh, jeweler screwdrivers, you'll run into these old uh, connectors, these old Canon and Switchcraft was the most popular. But without a screwdriver, you're never going to get inside of those connectors. You're never going to be able to fix them. You may as well buy new connectors, clip off the ends, and solder to new um, solder new connectors on them. Um, the most popular these days, and because of all the things I mentioned, um, these are, uh, uh, you can put on or take off these connectors, open them, uh, do all of the wonderful things you need to do inside of a connector completely by hand. Um, there's no screws involved. Um, Neutrix, I'm, I'm sorry, Neutrix, I always add an X there for some reason when I think of them. Uh, uh, Neutrik came out with theirs, I'm not sure the year, but once it took over, um, the industry was engulfed with them. They were much more versatile, uh, less moving parts for you to have to deal with. Um, uh, and the most wonderful thing about them is their strain relief has a little slit on the side. I'm going to go to a tight shot here so you can see it. Get in a good lighting angle there. There's a little slit there. So you can put this on at any time during uh, the course of making the connection. Now, there's also another company popular. Um, and the reason this company became popular is this is the company that bought Canon or bought the manufacturing rights to make the Canon connectors. This company is Amphenol. Um, and they make the same. XLR uh, connector, but with a slight variation in that their strain relief doesn't have a little slit on the side. 
with the tight shot, you can see that. Um, so there's no little gap on that. And I'll show you why that's important in a minute. But Amphenol is actually the company that relates directly back to Canon, the original manufacturer. Um, so uh, to start, uh, let's see, have I gone through all the tools we need? Uh, I talked about the fan, talked about that. Uh, tape measure. Tape measure is always a good thing to have. Uh, so you can check by reference as to how much of the end of the wire you're stripping off, uh, how much of the conductor you're leaving for the solder connection. Uh, you can also stretch it out to check the entire length of the entire cable. Um, and I think that's the end of my list of tools. Indeed it is. So let's get to some soldering. Um, along with everything else that you're going to need, um, make sure you start if you want to start a brand new cable, make sure you start with both ends of the cable at your beck and call. This happens to be a pre-cut 25-foot piece of cable. Um, 25 feet seems to be the industry standard for um, regular mic cables that you would use across the stage. Um, other common lengths are 10 feet, 5 feet, 50 feet and 100 feet. Um, there could be any uh, variety of length within those two, but those are the industry standards. It's what you're going to run into most of the time. Uh, 25 feet seems to be the most popular because it gives you uh, versatility to get from uh, any location on the stage. Um, uh, within a reasonable length. Um, if you're stuck with 10-foot cables and you need to get all the way through the, across the other side of the stage, you're going to need a multitude of 10-foot cables. Whereas with a 25-foot cable, four of these cables together and I've got 100 feet. Um, and that can get you all the way across stage and then some. But 25 feet seems to be the most common uh, amongst all cables. At any rate, uh, to start with, I want to make sure I've got both ends of the cable and they're both clean and I've got a nice cut clean end on each. Uh, before I start uh, stripping the cable, before I do anything else, I want to make sure I have the boot, as we call it. This is the cap. This is the end of the assembly on an XLR. Um, uh, without putting this on the cable first, you will find yourself with a wonderful soldered job on a beautiful connector and no way to close it up. So before you ever even start, make sure you put the boot on the cable. I'm going to be doing a male end on one side, a female end on the other. So I'm going to make sure that I've got my male end and female end open, ready, waiting, and both ends of the cable have the boot. Now with the Amphenol cable, or the Amphenol connector, I should say, um, because they don't have that little split on the side of the strain relief, I need to make sure if I'm doing an amphenol that I put on that strain relief at the same time as I do the boot. Um, uh, and that can be a real disadvantage uh, while I'm trying to do a quick repair. That's why we prefer the Neutrik because any time after I finish the solder, uh, solder connection, I can slip that uh, strain relief uh, back on the cable and complete the connection. The only thing the strain relief does is grabs the outside of the jacket and prevents it from pulling out of the solder connection that you've just made. I'm down to 10 minutes, so i got to hurry. Okay. Using my knife, I'm going to use my straight blade, and I'm going to allow for uh, the amount of 
uh, cable I need, or the amount of the conductor I need to make the connection plus a little bit. And I'll show you why in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and strip this down, just the outside jacket, until I can just see the copper of the shield. And if you'll notice, once I get this open, um, this is really nice cable. Um, you'll find a variety of cables that are not so good, uh, but the best way to tell that you've got a good cable is um, uh, the outside shield. This is a nice braided shield. Um, it's very strong, very durable, and completely wraps around the inner conductors. There are three conductors in a mic cable. The shield um, uh, and two wires inside. Uh, one will be uh, what we'll call hot and one will, what we'll call neutral. Um, uh, the importance of that will come in um, in just a moment when I get to the connector. At any rate, to get to this, to make sure it's all ready to go, I need to separate that braid. So with a knife blade or a small screwdriver, I'll start at the very end and start undoing the braid. And once that's stripped away, on one side, I can now pull that back around both of the inside conductors and twist it up real tight. That becomes my third conductor. Now there is a common expression that uh, my boss used to use whenever I, he was teaching me how to solder long ago when I was a little kid, um, what is the most important conductor in a mic cable? And the answer is all three of them. Now I'm going to strip away the ends of the inside conductors, and I'm going to strip them away pretty long. Now I only need about half of that amount for the actual connection. And it looks like, yeah, I'm all right. Um, but when I'm finished preparing this, um, I want all three of these ends to be exactly the same length. Um, so I'm going to work on the male end first. And here's a neat little trick for you. Um, if you notice, I've got um, uh, two ends of a mic cable already here in a vise. Um, oh, I didn't mention the vise. It's the tools you need, but it's always a good thing to have the vise uh, to hold things steady. Um, you'll notice, though, that I put two ends in the vise, um, and those are to receive the... Uh, uh, the innards of the connector I'm about to make. Um, the reason that's important, if I were to just try and make the solder connection on the end with just these, these get very hot and they will burn your fingers. Or you can lay it down on a table and it'll roll around and it'll be, it'll be really hard to make the connection. So I always have that to hold the connector in place. Um, at the shop, I've actually got an old uh, stage box that has rows and rows of males and females, so I can work on multiple cables at the same time. But for right now, I just want to work on one. So I'm set up in the vise with another old mic cable just to use to hold the, the pieces together. Um, at this point, I'm going to tin the ends. I'm going to put a reasonable amount of solder coating each of the connectors, or each of the conductors, I'm sorry. 
Um, so on the tight shot, and I'm going to change my other glasses so I can see better. Um, you'll notice that I've got a reasonable amount of solder on each of the three ends. But when I put all three ends together, you'll see that they're not all the same length. So before I make the connection, I want to trim those off to the exact length that I'm going to need for each of the terminals, each of the three terminals. Now you'll notice on the vise, I've marked where pin one is. There are three uh, three terminals on the connector. Um, pin one is on one side, pin two, which is hot, uh, and pin three in the middle. Um, the reason that's important is uh, going back to a cable tester, it will tell you if you've got continuity between pin one, pin two, and pin three consistent with the other side of the cable. However, pin one is the ground, is the shield that isolates, or insulates, I should say, uh, the inner two cables from picking up radio frequencies, interference, uh, magnetic disturbances from power and such. Um, that's why the shield is wrapped all the way around these two cables, uh, these two conductors, I should say. Um, so it's important that pin one on one side of the cable um, uh, coincides with pin one on every other cable in the world so that we can make sure the shield is hooked up to the shield on every other cable. Um, though the tester may show uh, continuity between pin one and pin one on the other side, pin two and pin two on the other side, pin three and pin three on the other side, if, um, if the shield is accidentally soldered in the wrong position, a cable tester won't tell you that. You need to actually inspect and see that that cable has pin one with a shield on it. Now, before I make the rest of the connection, I'm going to tin the terminals. I'm going to add a little bit of solder, just enough to make the connection. And with that, and making sure I've got my boot on my cable, I'm ready to make my connections. Um, as far as the color codes that you would use, uh, because different manufacturers of different wires, uh, different cables, have different colors that they use for each of, uh, for each of their cables. Um, what we've developed a standard for at our shop and seems to be um, the standard uh, at least across the country, if not around the world these days, uh, Whirlwind, manufacturer of a lot of multiple uh, multi-pin connectors and a lot of cable. Whirlwind is an um, uh, international company, internationally distributed company, and available on their web website, whirlwind.com, you can find their printout. It's available to anybody for free of common color codes. Um, boy, I'm down to a minute already. So with that, I've connected a mail connector. Um, keep in mind that when I was making the connection, I didn't just heat up the terminal and then stick the end in. I made sure to keep the heat of the soldering iron on the terminal and touching the conductor. It's very important to make sure that both elements of the connection are heated up uh, enough to uh, let the solder let the solder flow. Trouble with my words. At any rate, so I've now made my solder connection. I've got my boot on my cable. I can now slip the strain relief onto the cable. You, you'll notice a little notch that I can line up with the end of the connector. And then I've got my uh, shell, the outer metal shell. And that all slips inside, and then I can connect my boot. 
Now, one last thing before I close it up. And I'd like to get to the uh, female as well. Um, so when it's all done, it looks nice. It's all there. The reason that um, I put it inside of this connector to make the solder connection is I don't want those pins to move at all. And by applying a lot of heat, sometimes you'll melt the uh, the housing that holds the pins. Um, so by having it stationary while I'm making the solder connection, there's no way that um, uh, those pins are going to move out of position. Now, one last thing I want to show you is on a brand new cable manufactured by um, Let's say you went to Guitar Center and bought a brand new mic cable. Um, you're going to notice a jumper between pin one, the ground, and this little guy here. This is the ground connection for the shell. For um, any mic cable that you're going to use on stage or in a studio situation, um, you want that. You want to make sure that you have no connection between pin one and the shield. The reason that that's important is because uh, sometimes you'll have interference between one device and another um, that will create a buzz. And oftentimes the easiest way to alleviate that problem is to use what we call a pin one lift. That eliminates the ground connection on pin one um, through the cable to anything else. Um, so let's say I have a console on one side and a direct box on the other, um, uh, uh, direct box being a transformer um, from a uh, guitar cord or a bass or a keyboard or any other electronic instrument. Um, but I want that instrument to go to a mic cable um, and down an XLR line down what we call a balanced line. Um, if, the, uh, uh, if the signal has a buzz on it, uh, what we call a ground buzz, um, which is an annoying interference, um, we can use a pin one lift to get rid of it. But if it's, the chassis is connected um, uh, in the XLR um, to pin one, then we're still making the ground connection, and that pin one won't eliminate the noise. And I have run out of time. Um, uh, well, let's. let's it's uh, all good, Fetch. You can continue. We're good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to do the, uh, the female real quick just to get it done so you can see the difference between that without all the talking in between. I should be able to crank this out in just a second. And again, I'm stripping off just enough of the outer jacket that I need to make the connection. Opening up the braid. Stripping off my ends. All right. I will tin my terminals.
and then making sure that all three of these conductors are exactly the same length. The reason that's important is because when stress comes to this cable, I don't want one being too short or that will, um, uh, the other two will pull out, um, uh, will pull out of the terminals before the other one does. I want all the stress and all the strain to be the same on all three conductors. The other important thing about making these solder connections is I want to make sure the conductor is all the way inside of the cup in the connector. All the way inside of the terminal. And when I'm finished, I don't want to see any of the excess wire outside of the terminal. I want to make sure the insulation on each conductor is going right up to the terminal. And I snap on my strain relief, snap on my shell. and connect the boots. Now I'm ready to test the cable. Because no matter what you've done, no matter how wonderfully you've done it, no matter how meticulously you've stuck to every guideline and every single thing you could possibly think of to make a good cable, sometimes you make a mistake. You always want to make sure you test your cable as soon as you're finished making it. You could cut into that tight shot. And you'll notice all three green LEDs, that mean that cable is good. So I've done a good job on that one. All right. Um, I do want to get into uh, uh, some diagnostics, but we are a bit over time. So um, uh, let me leave it at this. Um, make sure you learn how to wrap a cable, overhand, underhand. Um, you can look it up online. There's plenty of YouTube videos showing how to do it. Um, there's plenty of people around you if you reach out that know how to do it, it is essential to keeping your cables in good working order for years and years to come by learning to wrap properly. Um, when you're making a wrap, uh, you want to make sure it's about a foot in diameter, um, uh, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depends on how long your arms are. But the reason that that's important is just at a glance, I can see how many wraps just at a glance. And if they're about that big around, I know each one is about two feet around. So uh, 12 wraps or so, I know this is a 25 foot cable. Um, uh, only five wraps, I'll know that's about a 10 foot cable. Um, uh, there are many ways of indicating uh, the links. Um, uh, shrink tube and labels and color codes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we use color codes at uh, the rat shop um, for different lengths of cable. Um, uh, all of that needs to be decided before you've made your connection as far as labeling. Um, but it's very important to learn how to wrap a cable properly. Um, and uh, when you've finished wrapping it, uh, to tie it off somehow. Um, Generally, as a uh, courtesy um, for those packing up equipment at RAT, what we use is electrical tape to wrap the cables. 
uh, to grip the cables. There's also Velcro wraps. There's also tie line. There's a million ways to keep your cable uh, uh, tied and and ready for transport. Um, when it comes to diagnostics, um, and keep in mind we're talking about a live stage, um, uh, one of the greatest tools you can possibly have at beck and call when you're checking lines on stage um, is a microphone. Um, sure, the cable tester will tell you exactly um, what terminal might be um, at fault in a microphone cable, but uh, in all live circumstances, our key enemy is time. Um, much as it is here on this webinar, uh, so I'm not going to be able to get to everything I wanted to. But in diagnostics, uh, think about um, everything in terms of um, process of elimination. It's a very key uh, expression to remember throughout the day. Um, patch points along the way from uh, the microphone on stage, let's say it's picking up a snare drum. Uh, uh, it may be patched to a stage box, which may be patched to another stage box, which may be patched to another and another, all the way back to the main panel before it gets to the console. Um, so if there's a problem with the line, it could be anywhere along any one of those patch points. Uh, fastest way to find where the problem is, grab a microphone, unplug the cable from the microphone it's supposed to be working, plug in the microphone that you know works, check it again. Does it, does it work? If it doesn't, go to the next patch point. Disconnect the cable, plug in a cable that you know works. Check it. Does it work? If it doesn't, go back to the next patch point. Um, all the way back, and sometimes you will find yourself with the uh, the end all, save all, be all, have to do it. There's no other way to get it done. What we call a home run. Uh, generally, I'll grab a 50 to 100 foot cable and run it all the way from the split or the panel, um, which gets the signal directly back to the console, all the way across stage, bypassing all the stage boxes and every other patch point, just to get that one microphone working because time is of the essence on a live stage. Um, I'd like to go into more, but um, uh, I do want to leave some time for you guys to ask some questions. Um, and I'm way over time, so uh, if we can leave it there and maybe get back to um, another session sometime to get into some more detail, that would be great. But I do owe it to you guys to answer some questions if you have any. What is AES cable? Ah, good question, and I'm sorry I didn't get to it in time. AES is a digital cable. Um, it's manufactured, oops, sorry. Um, it's manufactured specifically for um, digital audio. Um, uh, and I have an example right here. Um, uh, the difference is um, inside of the cable there is a particular rate of twist uh, of the two conductors inside of the shield, um, specifically rated for digital transmission. Um, keep in mind that digital cable is perfectly um, uh, perfectly fine to use for audio signal. Um, analog signal, a uh, regular microphone to a console. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, digital cable is perfectly capable of transmitting um, audio signal, um, analog audio signal. However, uh, standard mic cable, um, uh, though it can transmit the digital signal, does not do a very good job of it, um, and you will end up with signal loss. But AES cable um, is specifically designed for digital transmission. 
Um, and it is always written right on the outside. Boy, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it even with a tight shot. Um, uh, not really. Can you? Oh, okay. Um, it will be written on the fine print along with the cable somewhere along there. Uh, AES. Always look for that. Those three letters. Uh, it can also use, be, be used for DMX cable. Uh, generally, that is uh, 300 ohm. Uh, some of it's 150 ohm. Generally speaking, we use 300 ohm cable for AES. Perfect. Um, one came, uh, another question came in following that to go off of this. Can you tell us the difference between AES and regular XLR cable? Uh, certainly. Actually, I just kind of covered it in that last description. Um, um, uh, it's the same copper being used for each of the terminals. It's the same configuration as far as a shield wrapped around two, um, two conductors uh, to eliminate any interference. The only difference is there's a certain rate of twist of those two um, uh, inside conductors, um, uh, much the same way as in CAT5 cable. You've got uh, four pairs of wires inside of CAT5. Each pair has a different twist, has a different rate of twist uh, through the cable, so as to uh, prevent interference between uh, the data down one pair to the other. Um, but also uh, in the context of the transmission rate of the wire, um, without that twist, data is going to get distorted um, inside of a regular analog cable. And that's why it is so important to have AES cable um, to perform the duties uh, that you need it to for digital. Great. So we have a couple more. Um, do you use quad cable very often? Not very often. Um, uh, uh, quad cable being um, uh, four conductors uh, uh, wrapped with a shield. Um, it, uh, I believe Canary is a popular brand that makes that. Um, I believe Megami makes um, uh, uh, quad cable as well. It's kind of, sort of, think of it as an extra assurance. <laughs> um, uh, and basically when you're making the solder connection, you're picking two of the same color conductor and two of the same color connector um, uh, conductor and um, uh, terminating those to the same place as you would with just one. Um, but it gives you some reassurance in case there was trouble down one conductor, uh, the other one there to sort of pick up the slack. Uh, but it's also um, uh, a versatile thing to have as far as if you're doing multi-pin connections. Those conductors are available to you. It's just very hard without a meter to tell which is which. But yes, um, quad cable is available. It's um, uh, a little more expensive. Um, has a tendency to extend the life of your cable by using it, uh, but it's by no, no means uh, absolutely necessary. Okay. The next question is, what was the product name of the mic tester? Ah. <laughs> uh, the mic tester I always love to use and is my first choice is called the Sound Tools Sniffer Sender. Uh, they make one, uh, this one is for an XLR, as we were just working with. Uh, but if you go online to their site, soundtools.com, uh, you will find they make one for um, uh, NL4 speaker cable, NL8 speaker cable. They even make one for CAT5 cable, uh, or I should say Ethernet connectors, uh, which includes uh, eight separate conductors inside of the CAT5 cable and um, the ground shield um, uh, when used uh, uh, for those applications which require a ground on the CAT5. 
But it's the greatest thing in the world because you can leave your cable set where they are and still test the cable. You don't need to bring two ends of the cable to one place to test it. Okay, great. The next question is, what happens with the dependence and frequency response of an analysis microphone, in this case, DBS, if I exchange pins two and three using the same solder only uh, with a soldering iron? Wait, uh, run that by me one more time. Yeah. Miss the beginning. It says, what happens with the what happens with the impedance and frequency response of the microphone? Impedance and frequency response. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, can't say that there's um, I can't say that I know of a difference in impedance or frequency response. The one thing I do know is it changes the phase um, in the. Uh, and we're talking about an audio signal, an analog audio signal. Um, uh, by switching pin two and pin three, you've changed the phase. So when the diaphragm and the microphone is going in, um, the uh, signal generated would say uh, back at the console that the, the diaphragm is moving out. Um, now in A and AES, I am not certain if there is a um, uh, a difference in the data transmission. I'd have to look that up myself. Um, but as far as analog signals, changing uh, pin two and pin three uh, would only change the phase. Um, uh, that can be a hindrance or a blessing depending on the circumstance. It is always better to make sure, though, when you open up a cable um, and you just want to make sure that everything's going well, <laughs> um, if the tester shows you that something's out of phase, you want to open up the cable and see which color is on which pin on either end. Uh, the priority is making sure that the shield is to pin one on each end. But whichever color is to whichever pin, you want to make sure those are matched. It really won't matter which color they are, as long as they are the same at pin three on one side as it is on the other. And if it's not, then you need to re that in. Okay, great. The next question is, what's the difference between instrument cable and microphone cable. Can we use microphone cable as instrument cable, or is it best to use instrument cable itself? Uh, it's, uh, microphone cable can be used for instrument cable. Um, and you'd have to look this up on your own. Uh, there's a lot of information on it. Um, it's the difference between uh, high impedance signal and low impedance signal, or unbalanced being high impedance. Uh, and balanced signal. Um, there's a difference in the uh, uh, the gain of the signal coming down the line with a mic cable um, and with an instrument cable. Um, or uh, let me rephrase that. There's a difference in the uh, volume being generated to be sent down an instrument cable than there is down a mic cable. Uh, my cable is perfectly capable of sending the signal that way. Um, uh, there's an extra conductor involved um, that is not necessary for an instrument uh, to use um, for high impedance uh, or an unbalanced line. Um, but it's um, uh, perfectly capable of transmitting the signal. Okay, great. Well, that looks like all the questions that came through. I want to thank everyone for joining, and thank you, uh, Jeff and Sean, for your time today. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Before we sign off, I am going to share three links in the chat box with everyone. The first link is to our Harvard Professional University, so that you're able to access thousands of hours of curriculum, content, and certifications. This will give you an overview of information, and will let and will get you to the registration page to sign up. The second link is to our playlist on YouTube. I saw a couple questions come in asking where you can find past webinars. This is where you'll be able to find those. And the third link is to a full calendar of any upcoming webinars as well.
Great. Well, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and thank you again for presenting, Veg and Sean, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.